to listen to it, you'll be able to, or if you know someone who wasn't able to join us today and you think it might be useful, um, you can let them know about it. You are muted, so please submit any questions that you might have in the chat box. We're going to hold the questions until the end, but we have plenty of time for them. So just if you have a question as you go along, just submit it. And then probably of most interest to you at this point is this webinar has been approved for 1.25 CM credits. And when you go to log your credits, the event number is 9131988. So today in this webinar, we're focusing on integrating social values into adaptation planning and public finance. You're going to hear from C.J. Reynolds, a research associate at USF, about the Metropole NSF Research Project and what they've learned about social factors that shape resiliency planning in public finance. You'll also hear from David Lewis, who is the Executive Director of Save the Bay in Oakland, California, who will be joining us from the West Coast, um, about their Bay Restoration Program over a nine-county area and how they work to secure regional funding using a special district. But first, just to catch up on what's happening in Florida, I'm going to briefly cover a couple of things. I'm going to talk about the Natural Hazards Interagency Workgroup Bill that just passed. And I'm just going to give a short update on DEO's Statewide Community Resiliency Initiative and where that is headed. So House Bill 181 was passed this session. It was effective in July. and it creates the Natural Hazard Interagency Work Group. The work group includes all of the executive branches of, um, under the governor. It includes the water management districts, and it also includes the Public Service Commission. And the purpose of this work group is to share information on impacts of natural hazards, try to coordinate the agency efforts in addressing those hazards, and collaborating on statewide initiatives. The bill requires the work group to meet on a quarterly basis, and they can either do that in person or they can do it via conference call. And by January 1st of 1919, I mean of 2019, um, and every year after that, the work group has to submit an annual progress report to the governor and to the legislature. And everybody who is on that work group work group is responsible for ensuring that that report is posted on their respective agency's website. And I'm going to date myself by mentioning this probably, but this is not necessarily a brand new idea. Back in the late 80s and the early 90s when I was working at DCA, there was a similar informal working group and it was between DOT, DCA, and the DEP secretaries and they were trying to coordinate on planning issues. But that group was not formally designated or structured like this Natural Hazards Interagency Work Group is. The bill does include a definition of natural hazards. Um, you can see by the list on your screen that it's fairly encompassing. And I would note that um, sea level change was specifically included in the definition. So I'm going to just now turn to the Community Resiliency Initiative. Um, that is a DEO initiative funded in part through a grant agreement from the Florida Department of Environmental Protection, Florida Coastal Management Program, by a grant provided by the Office of Ocean and Coastal Resource Management. It's a 10-year um, plan, a 10-year project. It's now at the end of its first phase. And I just want to give a shout out to Barbara Lincheski for helping me um, pull together the summary. So as part of the first phase of the initiative, three major efforts have been completed. Um, DEO undertook a train the trainer project with all the regional planning councils on tools for vulnerability assessments, designation of adaptation areas and adaptation plans, and um, gearing that for their particular, particular issues in their particular regions. And each RPC, as a result, has a coastal resiliency planner designated who's there to help the communities in their region. It's a very good um, presentation that they have. So if you're interested in either getting the PowerPoint and looking at it yourself, or if you're interested in having the RPC actually do a presentation 
you can just contact your RPC and ask to speak to the Coastal Resiliency Planner. They also implemented a series of workshops on the recent parallel flood requirements around the state. And just to refresh your memory, the coastal zone element of, um, of Florida comp plans had required a redevelopment component that outlined the principles to be used to eliminate inappropriate and unsafe development in coastal areas. And that was basically all the law stated until uh, 2015. And in 2015, they amended that component to identify mandatory content. And in that mandatory content, it included addressing coastal flooding and related impacts of sea level rise as part of the redevelopment principles, strategies, and engineering solutions that have been previously required. And based on the information I received from uh, DEO, there are about 30 communities right now that are working on or completing the plan amendments related to peril of flood. And most of them are just um, incorporating policy language into their plan. They also focused on helping local governments implement adaptation action areas. And just as a reminder, those were the optional designations for areas experiencing or vulnerable to coastal flooding. And DEO worked with five pilot communities over this period, which are listed on your screen. But there were other communities around the state who are undertaking adaptation planning. And for example, Satellite Beach has designated action areas that are part of their recent plan update. And I've actually been told that Satellite Beach is a good example to look at. And as a shameless plug for our upcoming annual conference in Daytona Beach on September 5th through 8th, Satellite Beach is doing a session on its recent plan update. So you all should be make arrangements and plan to come. And then as a final piece of this initial phase, uh, DEO will be updating its post-disaster planning guidebook. And it's going to create an adaptation planning guidebook. Both hopefully will be done by June of 2018. Now in the next four years, uh, DEO will be focusing on working to implement adaptation planning with local governments and looking to have funding and technical assistance to local governments to implement adaptation action planning. And this year I've been told they're looking to contract with at least two local governments to work towards designating adaptation action planning areas and to identify actions. And the hope is that this planning effort will help these communities be viewed more positively for other funding sources like NOAA or DOT. And I would point out that um, going back to Satellite Beach, they were able to do this after designating adaptation action areas as part of their plan. The city was able to successfully get funding from Sea Grant to the tune of what I think was $200,000 to implement projects related to infrastructure impacts. So DEO is looking to work with local governments to position them to be able to do the same thing. Now, APA Florida as an organization has also been doing a number of things over the past few years to focus on resiliency and adaptation. We started in 2012 with a member survey in which we tried to figure out what our members wanted in terms of information and training with respect to climate change issues. And then based on those survey results, we've tried to have sessions at our conferences which address climate change. This year at our upcoming conference in September, for example, we are offering three separate sessions related to resiliency and sea level rise. So I'm very excited about that. We've begun to offer free webinars as well. This is the second webinar that we've done related to this issue, January 4th, which was entitled Tools Used to Assess Impacts of Coastal Flooding and Sea Level Rise. We recorded that webinar as well. And if you're a member, you can view it on our um, on our website. Um, about four years ago, we created a sustainability committee, which looked at the broader issue of sustainability and created the Livable Florida webpage on our website. And I hope some of you have already taken advantage of that. It's been up for a couple of years. It's intended to be a dynamic growing toolkit to provide planners with a starting point for learning about tools and strategies for integrating sustainability. And um, like I said, I encourage you, if you haven't gone to it, to check it out. The 
uh, website address is on your screen. We've also entered into collaborations with other entities, uh, including the Metropole Project, which you will be hearing about next. So as a segue to our next speaker, I want to note that international and national research agencies are increasing their support for research on understanding human behavior in response to environmental and social change. And local policymakers and planners working on resiliency and adaptation need a better understanding of the drivers and values that influence their decisions. So our next presenter, CJ Reynolds, will give us an overview of the Metropole Research Project, which focused on trying to better understand the role that social factors play relative to adaptation planning. So welcome, CJ. Welcome. If you want sure to that... switch to your screen. Yes, let us do that. Just a minute, we're having technical difficulties. <laughs> I'm waiting for the pop-up. Thank okay. you. Did we see it yet? Okay, one moment please. I need to uh, see my notes so I can make sure I stay on track for time. Excellent. Well, thank you. Thank you, Alex. I'm super happy to share some of the insights from the Metropole Project. Um, as many of you know, there's a lot of uh, growing evidence that uh, the broader cultural and environmental worldviews, not just climate change specific beliefs really play a central role in determining how people perceive and process and respond to these kind of risks. Um, I've worked on environmental and public health issues and communications for more than 20 years, developing a variety of executive education programs as well as national uh, media campaigns which were targeted at citizens um, that really integrated risk perceptions, values, and behavior um, all to uh, strive to achieve positive outcomes. Um, I know all of you have an enormous wealth of knowledge and experience about planning and policy. Uh, and so I, I just want to assure you that you can, by integrating some of these insights that we've gained um, into your practice, you will really energize your communities to a new level of engagement. And, and some of you may really feel uh, affirmed by your own experiences and how the context of this starts to play out. So I'm going to quickly go through um, what we've been up to and, and get you into some of the actual uh, background of that. So first, uh, the Metropole study really looked at the, um, the stakeholders response to risk. So I'll cover the specific aspects of adaptation options and how the implementation of priorities over time is perceived. Then I'll look at uh, the acceptability of different public finance mechanisms and the social and cognitive and psychological perspectives that are shaping um, our relationship with governance, money, and decision making, and then lastly, offer some suggestions for how we might integrate that into adaptation planning and stakeholder engagement. So first, um, we just want to briefly make you aware of a, an organization called the Belmont Forum. Uh, it was, our project was one of six international multi-year collaborative research action grants uh, focused on culture vulnerability, which was funded by the Belmont Forum. It is a consortium of research funders in over six countries, uh, 50 countries, excuse me, on six continents that have specifically targeted funds towards research that actively integrates stakeholders into the co-design and co-development process working with researchers. Um, I think that's really what was uh, quite interesting and most exciting to me about this was to work side by side with uh, practitioners uh, like yourself and many others. Um, so on the right, you see our specific research project was funded by four different uh, national science agencies. So in the U.S., the National Science Foundation, in the U.K., um, both their socioeconomic and environmental science agencies, and the Sao Paulo Research Foundation in Brazil funded that. And each, each country team was funded by their own agency. So the project was basically, um, we identified three study areas in across uh, each of our team zones. So we worked in Broward County, uh, Santos, Brazil, 
and Celsi in the UK, and quite a variety in terms of uh, geographic as well as uh, socioeconomic differences as well as size. And this was really designed to give us a sense of how different communities from very small to very large and affluent um, might look at some of these issues. So of course, uh, it wasn't just me, I was the project manager, but the project was led by uh, my director, Frank mueller Carger at USF. The US, US team included urban planners and faculty with adaptation planning and public finance expertise. Our teams in Brazil and the UK included leading climate scientists, uh, engineers, and social scientists. And additionally, we um, recruited an advisory board and relied heavily on them um, with experts in the US and the UK, uh, some from NOAA and DEO, and others uh, with planning policy and risk communications expertise. But the, um, I think perhaps the most important members of the team were the municipal partners, since you can see the logos from the left to right with Broward County and the three cities in Florida in the study that participated, Dania Beach, uh, Fort Lauderdale, and Hollywood were incorporated into the study zone. Uh, the city of Santos in Sao Paulo and the town of Celsi, and in that, um, which is really in the uh, southern coastal UK. So a quick overview of what the project itself was about, and uh, as I mentioned, our partners were actively involved in these things throughout the process, but uh, the first step was really um, using the coast software tool to model the physical uh, vulnerabilities to sea level rise and storm surge and calculating the cost of property damage and then creating also a cost benefit analysis of two adaptation strategies that were chosen by the community. Uh, the study areas included um, were, were contiguous 6,000 parcels in the UK and 10,000 parcels in Broward County and Santos 10,000 as well. Um, and we conducted these uh, workshops with the community, very interactive, typical things that you all have done, uh, no doubt, showing them the information, mapping it out, discussing the vulnerability assessments, discussing the risks and cost. And then at workshop two, uh, discussing the uh, avoided cost and avoided damage potential of the adaptation strategies that they selected and working on some other aspects um, to prioritize that. So then after that, um, well, before and after uh, the two workshops, we conducted uh, the surveys to collect the information on their values and beliefs and perceptions about adaptation. And then secondarily, we conducted uh, interviews with the uh, decision makers to really get a one-on-one, -on -one, a local perspective on um, adaptive capacity and what were some of the factors. And so all of this was to try to give us, uh, within a one year time frame, an understanding of some of the values and perceptions of the different leadership and how this was influencing adaptation planning and institutional uh, capacity. So the important thing is to understand well, who was in the workshops. So that gives you some context when you think about your own work. Um, this really was primarily uh, decision makers in community and citizen leaders and other experts. They were not the general public. Um, they were highly educated. Some were retired who were very interested in the issue because of their role in their um, condo or proximity. Uh, we had a good mix of political affiliations. That was a question we asked on the surveys. Gender was nearly equal with slightly more men than women. Um, and we also had a values question which identified where they were at in terms of uh, environmental perspective. and. Um, not to be, we weren't surprised based on the folks that are self-selected to 10, but those, most of them had moderate to strong pro-environmental values. Um, a good number of the participants had experience with coastal hazards and extensive flooding or in, either on a personal level or uh, living in the community that had seen it already. Um, and secondarily, just that a large of these were, a good number of them were homeowners as well. And again, the workshops were fairly small and that, so when we talk about what we've seen, you have a context of um, what does this mean for extrapolating this out to your audiences that you work with. So in this, uh, one of the key questions was to really investigate uh, their perspective about um, what they thought their local government should do and when. And um, what we showed them with this was the actual variety of um, adaptation categories that we had. Um, so you can see from land use and very specific questions. These were consistent to all the countries. Uh, and then we asked them to decide when these things should be implemented or if they should be implemented for each option. And the time frames uh, were now 10 years, 25, 100, never and unsure. 
So this really gave us a sense of, um, you know, trying to understand the priorities. And so we, did, again, did this right before the workshop and then again at the end of the second workshop when it was all said and done. So what we were surprised to find, let me click here, moving that one, clicking on the wrong button. So what we found, what was really interesting, was that across the three countries, we found that the same options, there was like a top five in, um, in terms of people choosing now. And so this was a majority, um, as you can see, which is, is really interesting from our perspective. And starting with the columns on the left, which was uh, restrict new building in vulnerable areas. And that was uh, the highest scoring option for the UK in the US and then um, as you see going further restrict rebuilding after uh, damage again from in vulnerable areas so it drops slightly but still in the top um, and then we looked at a set of questions so nature-based options conserve natural areas so Brazil that was their top option and very strong showing in the UK in the US and then increase natural areas so this was designated as wetlands um, mangroves and a strong showing for that in, in terms of let, we should do this now or local government should do this now and also very um, interesting turnout uh, in the uh, US and Brazil strong showing for implement green technology to reduce uh, flooding and it gave them some examples so um, this was again the top five and so then when we look at it slightly different in a different perspective um, different charts here it'll be a little bit overwhelming but really want to just give you a sense of the pattern in each country is what we saw is what I refer to as the green to gray pattern um, and when we looked at you, you put up all of the options that they have across the screen and the time frame so the time runs uh, left to right so now in the green yellow is 10 years Bright pink uh, is 25 years, 100 years, uh, never unsure and no answer. So the important thing to look at it on this scale, and this is for the UK, is that there's a similar pattern. And you can tell it almost in the ways the green starts at the top and shrinking down into now um, when you get down to the gray and more complicated options. And you have this very similar pattern in Brazil and again in the US and so that's the Broward County one so there are some differences in their actual rank order but what we tend to see is that um, hardening major infrastructure moving infrastructure uh, purchasing we, we offered a, a choice of purchasing land doing voluntary buyouts from businesses and or a separate one voluntary buyouts for residents and in most cases uh, this was a fairly lower rated in terms of now so in some senses people have a good perspective of well is this necessary now perhaps not we can do this later but we also think that there's other social factors uh, tying into these aspects of buyouts um, interesting uh, on the left side of the UK one build new or higher seawalls I and mean, they have a very low percentage so like um, uh, maybe 15 or 18 percent I can't recall right off the top of my head they already had a seawall so they felt pretty confident that their existing seawall did not need any attention um, after workshop number two we saw a very significant increase in that and that they really did um, the visualization that we used really did help them understand the fact that within a number of years the um, the seawall would be over top so um, we did see a lot of that so this was an interesting perspective um, and so the, the question is you know this probably isn't any su surprise to you guys I mean when you're out there with your own workshops you may see a lot of um, support for certain types of options over others and you know resistance to major scale projects whether it's transportation or um, any kind of large building it's just you know people are more reticent about that so this is really no surprise but what's really behind some of these when you try to pick apart what are some of the values or social factors and so we've turned to um, evaluating a number of other studies done by leading researchers to look at this and give us a sense of what is this so you may have read studies about the value and preferences about um, green spaces and we just you know green matters to us and so over more urban density and this is one of the challenges we have for planning um, and preserving these components the other aspects are that um, both through the anecdotal thing as well as the research that these green spaces really convey uh, multiple benefits co-benefits both now and in the future they're aesthetically pleasing they're going to improve the community um, and additionally we 
from the comments we heard, we, we people tend to perceive that some of these large-scale or nature-based adaptation options are probably lower cost than some implementation for major infrastructure. So again, these are the sort of perceptions of it's cheap, it's frugal, it's beautiful, um, and, and so these are other sort of the things. So why is there a delay when we get to green or larger scale gray projects, and, and it's familiar, no doubt, to all of you, is really the uncertainty um, about risks. Uh, we heard a lot of questions about, oh, you know, is this really needed? How is this going to impact our town? Is this the right thing? Can we wait and be more creative and do this better later? So there were some of those kind of trade-offs about their own quality of life in the community. So when we had a when we looked at the aspect of time, I was very excited. We were all excited. Oh, look at this! Now they want to do things now and in ten years. And so our goal was not just to take this at face value, but to try to dig beyond that. Um, we we really looked at these different behavior studies uh, to understand from cognition to uh, economics and we're able to identify a number of interesting studies that support that. So um, the first and most important thing is to recognize um, the aspect of leadership roles, both formal and informal leadership roles and the types of personality traits uh, that attract. So really um, when you consider who was in the workshop, they are self-defined as leaders and were, um, through the survey, highly motivated and or concerned. So again, this is not the general public and they, they had a lot of it. The other component is the aspect of social norms, which is the rules or behavior of behavior that's considered acceptable in a group or society. So when you're looking at electeds and staff and citizen leaders, taking action is generally recognized as a good thing. Um, also, however, on the flip side, that being a prudent fiscal manager might also be considered a social norm. So I'm not saying that it's a sort of a, you know, overarching aspect of what was driving this aspect of time, but social norms really are a strong driver of certain kinds of actions. Um, the other aspect is that you've certainly heard research about how concern and experiences with hazards increase your support. I mean, we would often uh, comment on, you know, the best opportunity to get something new done is after the crisis has passed, right? So this, this is common human behavior, whether it's a flood, a food safety outbreak, or some other sort of major catastrophe, we act after we've had that. So the question is, how do we elevate a level of concern and create awareness about hazards because we know that this will help us with planning, but without creating fear? So other factors um, influencing this time um, aspect, and I'm putting this together here backwards, um, was that uh, one of the key ones was that we really do, humans really do have a short-term mindset in a long game challenge. So um, a very interesting international survey uh, indicated that uh, it was really hard for people to imagine the future beyond 15 years. So there's a whole set of research called futurist research. Um, this was derived from a guy named Bruce Tong who has done a lot of work on sustainability and as other aspects. So, you know, other studies find that generally people do not make long-term plans for their life or their career and try to avoid thinking about risk. One of the most um, interesting and perhaps salient aspects that you will want to consider is this notion of future discounting. And this is drawn from behavioral economics. It's temporal meaning time or future discounting. And that people uh, generally, in things with immediate benefits are valued much more than future benefits. We will have preferences for smaller rewards that occur sooner over larger rewards and later benefits. So if you say, oh, CJ, I'm going to give you a bottle of wine today, or I'll give you three bottles of wine in a year from now, I would be likely under this theory to pick the bottle of wine today. Um, and, and so the question of how time frame um, expands, so the further out the time frame, the more we're discounting the value of the future benefits. So if we're talking in two years from now versus 20 years from now, we're going to put more, we're going to discount the value much further. So this is one of the big challenges. You are planners. You think long term. 
um, but clearly we're seeing people who prioritize things on a short term. And as you know, in many cases, the, short, the term gets shorter and shorter as we go. So um, another study, which I think uh, if you would go and look it up, has a lot of interesting aspect to it. But this is the global survey on public attitudes towards climate change done by Arizona State, looking at nine countries, very long, researchy type stuff. But the two key highlights on that is one that, again, their, their support for policies are correlated with the perceived level of consequences and the perceived level of threat, which was based on other research we identified as well. And that the people who oppose and strongly oppose climate change policies also are, are the people who do not expect the environmental changes to occur over the next 20 years and generally do not perceive climate change as a threat. So again, you have that context of the time frame and other components going on with that. So I'm going to switch gears um, and discuss the finance questions because this was also a component. So when we first asked them about their priorities, what should the local government do? Do you think it should be funded? How should it be funded? And so this was the key aspect we wanted to understand. Um, the workshop participants were asked to rate the comparative acceptability of six feasible public sector funding mechanisms. Um, these included from low interest loans uh, to special districts, a bond to finance, uh, as well as a fund based on property taxes, a surcharge on water utility bills. And then uh, because of differences in the national uh, regulations and policies, our teams had to slightly adapt the questions for each country. And Brazil is, um, in terms of their national government, and was fairly similar to the U.S., so we had consistency there. However, in the U.K., uh, substantial differences, so we modeled those, but tried to keep a parallel between fees that are specific versus fees that were general. And they were asked to rate this on a scale of one to five, one being not acceptable to five, totally acceptable. Um, so the highlights of this, um, was that, again, the U.S. and Brazil had a fairly consistent pattern of how they, uh, their levels of acceptability in the U.K. was substantially different, uh, reflecting their uh, national uh, government programs. And probably not surprising to many of you is that um, any of the mechanisms that had general charges to all community payers had the lowest scores, and so those were below a three. Uh, mechanisms that were directed at those who would who live in areas of risk or incur the risk or the benefits, those were more acceptable. And Brazil had the highest score of all of that. And then in between there, um, but also fairly high, were loans that enabled financing for adaptation but created no fees. So bonds and loans, these were more acceptable. And in fact, in pre-workshop one, um, the uh, the bond was the the high or the loans were the highest for the U.S. score. So that's pre-workshop attitudes of uh, elected officials, staff, and decision makers. Then what we looked at was after the workshop. We went to the participants who returned to compare before and after. And what we saw, and I'm going to just quickly show you so you can see the pattern overall, um, is that the U.S. shifted and Brazil shifted. Special resilience districts, the U.K. also shifted. So, um, the common pattern from top is more acceptable to down to the bottom is less less acceptability or lower acceptability rates. And you see some of the commonalities again on, on these aspects of these two countries. What was interesting was the public-private partnership uh, with infrastructure tax in the UK, which was a brand new uh, local government um, regulation that they were just, um, their federal government just enabled them to do that about three, four years ago. And so that that concept for them of levying this thing in, on specific to new development was something that they hadn't really understood. So I think in this case, the aspect of understanding finance before you ask the complicated questions of what is it we should pay, you know, we, we need more of sort of a finance 101 for folks. So when we looked at the data by gender and age and politics, uh, we found that these are factors. Um, so it's not all, you know, homogenous across everything. Um, for example, in the U.S., twice as many men 
um, thought sales taxes were not acceptable compared to women. Um, and we see, we saw specifically that age group, 55 to 64, in the U.S. generally rated all mechanisms lower than the other age groups. People over 65 actually had higher ratings than the people 55 to 64. So uh, you can imagine a set of, um, you know, financial, social issues that may be contributing to that. Um, and so when we looked at, in the U.S., the order by uh, political affiliation, we found that the, the rank order of the mechanisms was fundamentally the same across the three parties, which we had was Democrats, Independents, and Republicans. Um, so fundamentally, there's agreement, a commonality on the order of acceptability of mechanisms. However, uh, what was interesting was that the Democrats rated all options more acceptable uh, than the other two groups. Demo uh, independents were in the middle and Republicans uh, rated all uh, mechanisms. They had the lowest scores. So um, again, all of this points to a need for more research using a bigger sample, but I think that will be quite helpful in the future in really discerning some of the, what these different segments are, are looking at. And, and certainly we've seen other polling studies that show that these exact um, principles are in play. Um, so, you know, the bottom line, I just want to say to everyone, is there is no such thing as a general public. We really do need to work hard to imagine uh, what our uh, different audiences might be and construct our information and our communication to help them uh, connect to our stuff. So, uh, one of the biggest things that I, we felt that came out of um, the finance component um, was the what we call the fi the fairness perception. Uh, there are a number of studies which look at fairness. Fairness is a deeply rooted human value, um, but how our own personal values and self-interest influence our perceptions of fair, this is the interplay that we need to tease out. Um, so there's a number of studies, but this one is, I think, key. And when you think about your own organization and how you can communicate it, so when people think that institutions are functioning fairly and behaving fairly, they are likely to be su more supportive of those institutions. Uh, when they believe that the, their perceptions of the process or procedural fairness, those things also influence the policy support. Now, on the other side of that aspect is that political ideology does moderate the relationship between the perceptions of system fairness and support for uh, the redistribution of taxes. So there's a lot of things that are, are quite challenging in this and probably would be a whole workshop just unto itself to tease apart the differences of finance that we can use, how we communicate that and what does that mean in terms of fairness. Um, but I've seen elected officials, we did a lot of extra research looking at um, media and doing a media analysis of uh, comments around um, public finance mechanisms in 2015 and 2016 and you know, there's things like, well, it's fair that everybody pays and, and that is not how citizens look at things. Um, spreading the cost of one group's risks uh, to all is not perceived as fair uh, by those who do not incur the risk. But, if you are the one incurring the risk and benefit, you think it's fair. So you have to keep those things in mind. Um, and I think there's some stuff that we can learn from the insurance industry issues. I'm not saying that they've done it well, but what we, what can we learn about how, whether it's home insurance or healthcare um, and life insurance, the aspect of everyone contributes and how this is a collective good and why we need that versus just me and mine. So some things in that. Um, because of the interest in special districts, I wanted to just suggest um, that some of you uh, take a new look at the role of special districts to identify potential funding for adaptation and resiliency um, in there because this clearly resonated um, with the human perceptions of fairness. As we know, you know, it sort of focuses the fees and costs. Um, it also, when done well, empowers um, the citizens to govern their own neighborhood and offers the possibility to support and enhance regional collaboration. And I'm thinking of uh, specifically, you know, the Indian River Lagoon Council and what they were doing. And I've seen other things like the Lake Okeechobee Compact that's now developing, not talking about funding as a special district, but working around Lake Okeechobee. So I would encourage you to check out the uh, district's uh, workshop or uh, website and uh, look for more information there. 
So the aspect of public financing and some of the takeaways from there, it's really important for you to frame communications, uh, linking your benefits and raising awareness of that, offering uh, clear short-term co-benefits and then defining uh, the steps in the short term, the costs and the associated timelines and then understanding, trying to figure out how you can uh, work with your different audiences, values, age and gender and other components and factors. Um, and so just in the aspect of, you know, how can we, what, what can we learn from this? I think taking away and looking at your nature-based adaptation, uh, land use policy, incorporating public finance information into everyday conversations and using these incremental things to move forward. All of this is going to really help you when you're working on your communicating of your public finance op options and, and showing how they can really benefit locally. So I put together just a quick checklist for you and so when you download the presentation when it's all over you'll have that, some of the key points. And uh, also what I want to encourage you to do is there's a uh, resources handout that you can, uh, it's in your go to meeting box over there, you can download and click on that. Uh, we'll be working to compile more of the social research into things. And then lastly, I would say if you're really wanting to get into a hardcore communications messaging workshop, join us at the APA um, conference in Daytona Beach. We're going to build on the topics we've discussed today in a much more um, client or uh, citizen electeds driven communications workshop and, and help you hone in on that. So if you are going to attend, you can upload your project questions and ideas and um, help us understand and, and sort of shape what you want to talk about. So um, thanks for that and I'm happy now to turn it over to David Lewis. Hi everyone, um, I'm David Lewis, the Executive Director at Save the Bay in San Francisco Bay. So uh, pretty far from all of you. Uh, can everybody see, can anybody see what's uh, uh, my presentation on your screens. Is that working? Yes. Great. Great. Okay. Um, well, uh, thanks. I really appreciate being able to participate and the presentation that you just uh, heard touched on uh, quite a number of themes that I'm going to be talking about in a specific way. Uh, every place is different. Every region's adaptation needs and challenges are different. Uh, so I hope that you'll be able to take something useful for what's going on in Florida from a recent experience that we have had and led in California. And that's what I'm going to talk about today. Because the one thing that I think is common around all the regions is the need for more funding. More funding for adaptation and for uh, habitat restoration. So I'm going to talk about an effort that we've been involved in for more than a decade that actually culminated uh, in a successful new stream of funding for tidal marsh habitat restoration and associated shoreline protection. Um, and just to skip to the punchline, uh, the funding measure that we passed is going to create a half a billion dollars over the next 20 years for that purpose from the uh, property owners in the San Francisco Bay Area, all nine counties here. So uh, let me start, let's see if I can move this, yeah, by setting the scene and just uh, remind you this is a shot of San Francisco Bay from a satellite. Uh, it's the most altered estuary uh, on the West Coast, some say in the world. And from this uh, satellite shot, you can see basically all the gray areas near the shoreline are uh, urbanized. And the bay, the total uh, part of the bay that is open to the tides is actually one-third smaller than it was in 1850 uh, when the California Gold Rush started and significant development occurred. Uh, kind of through an accident of history, some of those areas that were diked off for development and for agriculture and for salt evaporation ponds, some of them have been paved over and developed, but some of them have actually not been altered very much other than the dikes and levees being built. And so they are available for tidal marsh restoration uh, by letting the tides back in, but of course there's some complications to that because of all the development that's built up. So you can see those in the f on the top of this screen, uh, areas that uh, look like fields and different colors of ponds, 
And then in the southern end of the screen is the Silicon Valley in San Jose, and you can see those brightly colored areas. Those are uh, salt evaporation ponds. Um, I, mean, I can explain the colors if people are interested. Uh, the primary driver for the habitat restoration that is occurring in San Francisco Bay is some endangered species, and two of those are the California Ridgeways Rail and the Salt Marsh Harvest Mouse. There are others. Uh, but there's actually a federal mandate to try to recover those species, and we need more habitat to do that. So there used to be 200,000 acres of tidal marsh in San Francisco Bay, and now there's about 40 as a result of all that development. Starting a couple decades ago, there were some landmark scientific studies that established not only the need to try to get back to 100,000 acres, but the actual opportunity. So it wasn't just uh, pie in the sky. There are actual places where this habitat can be restored that were not too developed to do that. And that was established by the late 90s as a, as a scientifically agreed upon goal and kind of a blueprint, uh, somewhat short of a land use plan or a mandate. More recently, that study was updated to take into account climate change and sea level rise. And it came to the same conclusion about what needed to happen. But it emphasized that we need to start this restoration work and revegetation of uh, ponds and diked areas sooner to stay ahead of sea level rise. Those tidal marshes can adjust to sea level rise if it doesn't happen too fast and if there's enough sediment available for them to uh, build up uh, when, when uh, the tides get higher. Just to give you a picture of what this actually looks like, um, over the last several decades there have been some initial efforts to restore more of these areas. And basically, all you have to do is let the tides back in. That brings in sediment and most of the seeds for the plants. And these areas revegetate themselves. You can see the before and after at the bottom. Uh, when the waters come back, the fish come back. When the fish come back, the birds come back. And these are very biologically rich areas, this tidal marsh. So why hasn't it all been done? Well, um, it requires permitting and funds to do the construction work. But for the most part, the big cost is protecting the adjacent areas. When you let the tides back in, suddenly the tidal range in the bay uh, is nine feet in some places. And so you need to protect uh, developed areas and infrastructure inland from these areas. And that's where the big expense, cost, and, and time uh, comes in. Uh, I'll show you, zoom in to the South Bay here and Silicon Valley. Uh, you might recognize some of the land features, but San Jose is on the right, and you can see these brightly colored salt ponds. Those are areas that used to be tidal marsh. There's a, uh, more than 16,000 acres just in this part of the bay that can be restored. But you can also see it's right next to big development, um, high value uh, residential areas, business areas, uh, including the campuses of Google and Facebook and the server farms that uh, people all over the world are accessing. And major infrastructure that goes through these areas, like roads and railroads. There's sewage treatment plants on the shoreline and schools. There's lots of infrastructure to protect. So uh, what we really discovered uh, more than a decade ago at, say, the Bay was that there was a combination of opportunities here. We have a scientific and agency consensus on the goal of restoring habitat. We have some successful examples of project implementation that are working. We have large sites available to, to do this restoration at a landscape scale. And we also know that we have uh, strong public support in the Bay Area for the Bay generally. So uh, we identified the biggest missing ingredient was funding. We actually did a study in 2007. You don't need to read the details of this chart. But what it did was add up all the areas that were already in public ownership waiting to be restored to Tidal Marsh. And that was, at that time, 36,000 acres beyond the 40,000 acres of existing tidal marsh. Um, and we actu actually asked each of the landowner agencies in control of those properties to give us an estimate of what it would cost to restore them to tidal marsh and manage that over 50 years. And of course, the biggest cost is building new levees adjacent to these restoration areas to protect adjacent infrastructure. The estimate at that time, and I emphasize this was only an estimate, but the best we had in 2007 by adding all that up was $1.4 billion, which sounds like a lot of money and actually did cause some sticker shock when we released this study. But at the same time, we had did some general public opinion polling. We had actually been doing it for years, showing that at least in concept, 
people here in the Bay Area would be willing to pay uh, a part of this total cost in hopes that the federal and state governments would also put in some of the money since most of the restoration areas are actually federal land on federal wildlife refuge. Uh, people would be willing to pay part of the cost if, as the previous speaker highlighted, if they had a perception of the value, if they understood why that was important for the health of the Bay, and if they thought it was being done uh, equitably in a shared way. So the big advantage we have is that there are also 7 million people living here in the Bay Area and a lot of wealth and wealthy property. So it might be possible to split up that 50-year cost, uh, divide by 50 years, divide by 7 million people. Now you're getting down to you know, a man potentially manageable cost, right? So we figured it all out, right? Well, <laughs> there's a lot of complications from getting to where we were in 2007 to the successful raising of half a billion dollars towards that 1.4 billion total. Uh, among the challenges, you know, this uh, area is covered by a lot of different political jurisdictions. We have nine counties that touch the bay. We have multiple state, federal, and regional agencies that have different regulatory responsibilities and opportunities. And of course, many of those are cities and counties that are interested in tax revenue for other purposes. So. Every place has its own different political geography that makes, makes things uh, complicated. And uh, even though we have all of that um, and all the other elements on this slide that were in place, um, we did not have a way of proposing a regional funding mechanism. No way to propose uh, easily collecting a tax uh, or fee from the people of the region to help pay for these benefits. We figured out pretty early on that among the undesirable ways of, of making that possible, the least undesirable was actually to create a new agency. A little bit counterintuitive because people feel like, well, there's lots of government already. But there was no existing entity that had the power and the opportunity and the mandate to do this work. So we actually created a new special district. The previous speaker was talking about the benefits of special districts. Uh, we, in California, we had to do that through the legislature. So we actually had to get a bill passed and signed by then Governor Schwarzenegger to create this agency. And a couple of things that we had to do to get it created, we had to have it not cost the state any money, even though the state legislature had to establish it. Uh, we had to give it a narrow mandate so that it wasn't bumping into other agencies' mandates. Um, so we created it. Uh, it's a special district. It, its only mission is to raise money for the purpose I just mentioned. Uh, we gave it powers to propose those kinds of taxes. Uh, we gave it a governing board of uh, elected officials from the region. We found a way to have those people be appointed so that they didn't actually have to run for office for the special district that had no money. Um, and as an NGO, we essentially staffed it over the last uh, seven years to help that agency do research into how it, once it was established, how it could actually propose uh, a tax or fee that would pass. So among the questions that the agency spent uh, the last, you know, between 2009 and 2016 looking at, where should it propose a tax? You know, in the whole nine Bay Area County region or just a part? California has some pretty specific tax laws. I'm sure Florida does too. Uh, there are different kinds of, you can propose sales taxes, property taxes. Each of them has different majority requirements. Each of them has different limitations on specificity. Well, some of them require a supermajority. Uh, should we specify the, in this funding measure exactly which projects to fund? A lot of successful park and resource measures are very specific because that makes voters more comfortable voting for the money if they know exactly where it's going to go. In this case, this entity only exists to raise money and give project grants. It doesn't own any of the property, so it's not really in control of which projects would be ready when. Um, and then the timing. When do you go to voters with a tax uh, and how do you frame it and campaign for it in ways that make it most likely to be successful? So um, let's come back to sea level rise. You know, the motivation that we found in polling, which I'll show you in a minute, uh, most people in the Bay Area actually believe that sea level rise is caused by uh, humans and that we should be doing a lot about it. We're 
we're ahead of a lot of the country in that way. But it's not a primary motivator for why people, you know, love the bay or feel the bay is threatened. They're mostly concerned about fish and wildlife and pollution. However, there are key constituencies here who are much more worried about sea level rise and extreme storms and the impact on the economy, and those are the business community. And we knew because of the polling that we needed to have support from the business community. In fact, we needed to have almost no organized opposition in order to win the kind of tax that we wanted to win. So we needed to do some education about the connection between restoring these shoreline areas to tidal marsh and uh, and uh, flood protection, uh, improving protection for the shoreline against climate change and sea level rise. So one of the business organizations here in the Bay Area did a study uh, called Surviving the Storm, uh, happy to point people to exactly where it lives. It basically modeled a really extreme storm event for which there is historical precedent here in the Bay Area, an atmospheric river, basically days and days of rain, sometimes in the wintertime, warm rain that melts a lot of snow and causes a huge amount of flooding. Um, this did actually happen in 1862, and smaller versions of it have happened since. If it happens also at the same time that there are extreme tides, then you get kind of the perfect storm, pun intended. So this uh, study modeled specifically what would happen. Um, you can see that uh, hundreds of thousands of residents are at risk because they live in low-lying areas. There's a lot of, uh, of high-value infrastructure in those areas. Uh, it even modeled some of the disruption of business that would occur. It's not, uh, the point is not that a, one particular uh, office building might be at risk or one particular area of homes, but if the roads that connect people uh, and the trains that move people around are knocked out, or the sewage treatment is knocked out, or the power is knocked out from a major storm and for an extended period of time, that's a big risk to the Bay Area. So uh, again, I can point people to the, the details of that study. Similar studies have been done elsewhere. But the study also recommended, among the strategies to address sea level rise, exactly what I've been talking about for the last 10 minutes, which is restore more of the wetlands adjacent to this infrastructure. Uh, it's worth it for the Bay Area to invest some of that money and for local residents and property owners to help pay for it because it's going to provide multiple benefits. And oh, by the way, this, this special district that we created and its mandate fit quite nicely with this agenda. Um, so here's the measure that the Restoration Authority decided to actually put on the ballot. Uh, it was last June, which was the presidential primary ballot in uh, California. Uh, it proposed a tax of $12 per parcel, every taxable parcel. Uh, there are some non-taxable parcels in the, in the Bay Area, like schools and churches, but every taxable parcel that already pays property taxes would pay $12 per year, a dollar a month, and because there are so many parcels in the nine counties, it raises half a billion dollars over 20 years, about $25 million a year. That money comes into the special district, and the special district has some priorities for funding these projects. The map on the right shows just how extensive the potential projects are. These were not mandated in the measure, but they were examples. Of, uh, we did a, cast a wide net for ideas for eligible projects. Um, and then the Restoration Authority can provide grants to support those projects all around. Um, so the last thing I really want to highlight is the role of public opinion and polling in figuring all this out. Uh, here's a, a slide that shows polling on this question over time. Uh, you can see on the very bottom of the bar chart that the specific uh, amounts proposed were slightly different in the polls. Uh, the universes of people asked and the modeling was slightly different. Uh, but the kind of uh, tax that we were proposing, a parcel tax, uh, requires a two-thirds majority, a super majority. And you can see from the very beginning uh, many years ago, you know, it was always close to that 67%. Uh, and uh, the, the dark blue is strong support, the light blue is, you know, leaning to support. You can see there's not much margin for error. Um, the last poll that we did, uh, you know, was 77%. Um, and the final results, we won by 70% of the combined vote in the nine area counties. 
uh, I think the real point of this slide is just how much you have to poll to really understand a set of voters, especially this is 3.5 million voter universe. Uh, if it's a smaller area or more discrete project or proposal, you might not have to poll as often to really understand people. And people's views also change over time, mostly depending on how the economy is doing uh, is the biggest factor. I thought I'd show you just some examples of uh, message results that we got from the public opinion polling. This is a snapshot from 2014. And uh, what, what I'm going to show you is the highest, the, the, the messages that perform best as reasons to support a $12, in this case it might have been $15 per year parcel tax for San Francisco Bay. And you can go back and look at these in detail later, but you can see that this message about stewardship and taking care of this place we love for the future is really among the top messages, uh, protecting fish from pollution, uh, and this, this message at the bottom is a different version. You know, we like having the bay for multiple reasons as a recreational resource and just actually because it's pretty, right? Kind of second tier messages that did well uh, or were convincing to a lot of people, very convincing or somewhat convincing. You can see the, I, the, we did test a lot of different ways of asking about sea level rise and you can see this one about flooding did, did better than all the other ways we tried to talk about it. Basically nobody thinks they're gonna be affected by a flood, even people who are directly affected and live in low-lying areas. They don't, they're not worried about flooding unless there's been a flood recently. Um, other messages are about you know, keeping the economy strong and, and all of us living in a healthy place. Um, and uh, I didn't show you here, but I can certainly show people messages that didn't do very well, didn't do as well. Uh, specific recreational messages like I wanna be able to sail or windsurf or get in the bay and have it be clean. Uh, did not did not perform as well. Interesting, very interesting and unusual here in the Bay Area. Uh, when we asked people if they cared whether the money was spent right in their community and their part of the shoreline or wanted it to be spent where it would do the most good for the Bay overall, uh, the latter did much better, which is great news because that meant we didn't have to specify projects and highlight projects that the money would be tied to supporting in each area. People really have a sense of this as a regional resource, um, which, is, which is really great. Um, and here, this last slide on polling just underscores what I've said. People were much more interested in wildlife and water quality benefits than they were in flooding. You can see at the bottom that particular way of talking about it, um, and recreation. So, um, I didn't, I'm not showing you the 30 second ad, but I'm showing you a clip from it. Um, and there's an, a URL there for, uh, you can see the ad on YouTube. There's actually more than one. These were TV ads that we placed on cable. We actually raised enough money to do that um, as part of our campaign. And I encourage you to watch it because you'll see that it's really feel good ad um, about how great the Bay is and beautiful for families and wildlife. Everybody's smiling. Uh, you know, nothing about floods. <laughs> There's a scientist in there with a test tube trying to suggest that, you know, this making the bay cleaner, you know, is a stronger message when you show a, t a scientist with a test tube. Um, and the point is that uh, the, the reason for doing all this message testing is to test what people think and how they think about what you're proposing and really reach people where they are not where you are or where I am as an expert who thinks about this all the time, but as somebody who's going to think about it for two minutes before they cast a vote. Or maybe the voters aren't the ones who matter. Maybe you just have to convince a city council. Uh, then, then it's the combination of message and audience that fits with your goal. Um, and even if you're trying to change people's mind about something, which is a lot harder, you still need to start with where they are and what they currently think, even if you hate it. Um, just quickly, we, we built a very broad coalition to run a campaign, a uh, political campaign in support of this measure. Uh, we had business leaders, environmental groups, unions, and a lot of local government uh, and elected officials at all levels. We actually had 2,000 endorsers. I think the website for the campaign, uh, for the SNAA campaign is still up there. You can see everybody from the governor down to the dog catcher. Uh, and here are the final results. Uh, we won with 70.3% of the vote. 
uh, a big factor was choosing the right ballot to be on. We actually chose not to be on the November presidential ballot uh, because our polling was good, the economy was good, and we worried that the later we waited after June, the more chance there was the economy would go south. The other factor was the November ballot was much more crowded with a lot of state measures and other things. And we didn't think we'd be able to get people's attention. We didn't think we'd be able to afford to pay for advertising uh, when there's much more demand from lots of campaigns at the same time your campaign advertising dollar doesn't go as far, the, the, the campaign ads are actually more expensive, the TV time is more expensive, and people are overwhelmed. They're not really listening to anything. So we guessed right. We picked the right uh, ballot in June, and, uh, and we were successful. Uh, so just a quick sum up, and then I'm happy to take any questions. Uh, what I said at the beginning, you know, this is a specific example of what we did here, which is not to suggest that the specifics of the, uh, the, the tax laws, the uh, public opinion, the political geography are the same, but um, that you need to be attuned to what it is in your area if you're going to be successful for us. The key thing was voters love the Bay. Now, we all, we, while we had to understand and tweak the way we talked about that, um, that resonated with people, it's a huge advantage that we're starting out with an effort to try to improve and protect something that people already love, um, even if that love is um, shallow and superficial, honestly, uh, <laughs> in terms of, you know, it, it's an aesthetic thing first and foremost. Um, second, we were ambitious. You know, this had never been done before and we raised half a billion dollars, but that's only a third of what that 2007 estimate was for what we needed. We didn't want to be greedy. Uh, we tested higher numbers in polling, and it was even harder to get to th two-thirds vote. So better to have something uh, and, and not insignificant than to be too greedy and, and lose. Uh, third, I just, as I just mentioned, you know, we, we worked on this. I've been working on this for 13 years, um, and the Restoration Authority is working on it for seven years before finally pulling the trigger and deciding to go. So the timing was not just you know, what the political environment would support, but when we were able to build a broad enough coalition of supporters, we ran a shoestring campaign that still cost $3 million in support of this measure. So raising that money um, was a challenge uh, on top of, you know, all the other fundraising that I do for a nonprofit organization. Uh, we focused a lot on minimizing the opposition, understanding who might oppose this. And part of the reason we chose the tax we did instead of a tax based on the value of property was we didn't want to piss off and create enemies of uh, individuals and companies that own tons of property and would have a very high tax bill instead of just $12 per parcel. You know, there was a risk in that because $12 per parcel is not particularly progressive. It's flat um, and even. Uh, so that's not it. That's equal, but it's not equitable. Uh, and so we had to be prepared for that kind of opposition argument. But in the end, we had some anti-tax groups oppose this. But really, you can see we built a very, very big uh, uh, coalition of supporters. Uh, we did it on a shoestring, but we had a lot of uh, donated labor and uh, a lot of love from people and in-kind support. So we were able to be successful. Uh, I think I'll stop there. Uh, happy to answer any questions. Thank you, David. I appreciate that um, presentation. And um, if anybody has any additional questions, if you want to go ahead and uh, send them, uh, that'd be great. We did get a couple in. Um, and I think, David, uh, this one's for you. As you went through this effort, what was the one thing you wish you had done differently? Um, well, uh, the one thing I wish I had done differently turns out to have, would have been a mistake. Uh, we were really pushing hard to do this in 2014. Uh, I was worried at that time about sustaining the momentum. I felt like we had been working on it for a really long time. And we pushed hard to make it happen in 2014. Uh, and we didn't primarily because we just didn't think we had enough funds in hand to manage a campaign. Um, 
And that was actually the signal that it wasn't time. And as it turned out, 2014 was a very bad and angry election. <laughs> <laughs> In California, we, we would have lost. Um, uh, so, you know, some I'm an, I'm, an, I'm an impatient person by nature. I think a lot of advocates are, especially people who see problems that need to be solved and situations getting worse. Um, so, yeah, the one thing I wanted to do was do it sooner and be in a rush, and uh, that, that would have been a mistake. That would have been a mistake. Okay. Um, and this question, I think, might be for both CJ and David. Um, we got a question that said, we don't, and I think you said that the messaging, testing, and whatever was $3 million. No, um, that, was, that was actually the whole um, advocacy campaign uh, from the time the measure was decided to be put on the ballot, so about three or four months. We spent a lot more money before then uh, on research, including polling. Okay, well, this question is a two-part question then. It was, um, how much did the messaging testing cost was the first part. And then the second part was, we don't have staff with communication experience or big big budgets for this type of research, what can a planner do? Well, so as a kind of a rule of thumb, uh, you can do, the, the cost of polling varies depending on how many people you're asking the question. And if you're just starting out, you want to do a small poll of 300 to 500 people and depending on the length of the poll, that could be as little as $10,000 to $15,000. To do more detailed analysis of which parts of the electorate think which way, do women think differently from men, do older people think differently from younger people, parts of geography, you're, you, you need subsamples. And those start to become not statistically significant unless you start out with a big pool of maybe 1,500 people so that a full poll of like that could cost more like fifty thousand um, dollars as far as uh, you know not having the money and I totally understand that from an agency's perspective I think at the at the one of the first steps of doing something like this if, if you know what your ultimate goal is is think about who the allies are and some of those allies might have resources uh, might be nonprofit organizations that can raise money from charitable foundations, because a lot of the work before you are actually on the ballot is 501c3, tax deductible, it doesn't have to be with you know hard political money. Um, there might be businesses uh, that are interested in being involved at the beginning and supporting this kind of research. So it's really lonely if you start off by yourself, I would say. And it's <laughs> worth it's Please. worth thinking early on about, I mean, politics is about Winning in politics is about addition. You know, you have who you have, who do you need, and how do you get them? Um, so it's it's okay to bring other people into the tent at the beginning, especially when there's not, you know, they don't have to sign up for a binding outcome at the end. They're part of the, and that also gets people and, and the institutions invested in the project if there's still some decisions to be made, right? Instead of just calling somebody up and saying, I know exactly what I want to do, and here's how much money I need from you. Sometimes that's appropriate, but um, one thing I'd yeah. want to offer on this because I know we have to go quickly, but is that um, forming a business advisory group, looking at your uh, top regional PR and marketing agencies, and and trying to identify because those are the people who write and create pro-consumer messages day in and day out, and, and you'll know who some of the best ones are. And San Francisco has amazing agency staff. Um, some of us may not have those in our backyard, but I think when that building with your business group, looking to see among the actual people who work on uh, message development from a positive perspective, by you telling them what is it we need to do, um, where are we trying to get to, that's one way of getting, making your messages more aligned to some of these values and, and I was going to just say, you know, looking at the, the information that's coming out of this presentation, specifically from the California model, I think will get us a long way. So um, that's it. That's my tip. Yeah, I would add that um, where this whole idea started was a good friend of mine who had worked for me as a 
uh, political consultant on something totally unrelated 13 years ago who said, hey, you know, most of what I do is helping the Trust for Public Land and the Nature Conservancy all around the country with conservation funding measures, how to put funding measures for parks and other things on the ballot. And he just said, look, at, looking around the Bay Area, I can see people of the Bay, and you have so much wealth here, there must be a way of having people in the Bay Area pay part of the cost of making the Bay healthier. You know, it was just a random idea that he threw out, uh, although he happened to be connected to some communities that you know, we could start talking to. He's now actually a state senator and pretty influential on this stuff. So um, th there are people who can be resources in figuring out the different parts of this, and that might include, you know, elected officials who are sympathetic, uh, or or business people, or environmental groups who worked on this kind of thing. Well, great. Um, unfortunately, we're out of time. I want to thank you and da you, David, and I want to thank you, CJ, for being part of this webinar and sharing your knowledge on this issue. And I thank everybody who joined us as a listener and hope that you found this to be useful. As I said, it will be uh, posted on our website uh, and can be accessed by our members. Um, so thank you again. And for the people who are participating, as you know, when you do AICPCM credit as part of it, we have to have an evaluation of the presentation. So you'll be getting an evaluation um, sent to you immediately following this. And we'd appreciate it if you would fill it out. So thank you again, everyone, and have a great afternoon.